Get Rich Education is brought to you by Valhalla Wealth and Ridge Lending Group. You're listening to the show that has created more passive income for people than nearly any show in the world. This is the powerful Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE, Get Rich Education, episode 179. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, from Saratoga, Australia to Saratoga Springs, New York, and across 188 nations worldwide, this is Get Rich Education, and we are cultivating a real estate of mind here. That is because wealthy people either start out in real estate or wealthy people's money ends up in real estate. It's either one or the other. And you know, the most important piece of real estate may very well be that real estate right between your two ears, your mind. We come from an abundantly minded place here at GRE. If you want to learn about combining vinegar and water in a bottle because it's cheaper than Windex, well, you're not going to learn about that here. If you've been wearing the same pair of monthly contact lenses for two years, then, well, you really didn't learn how to do that here either. In fact, money itself is an abundant resource, not a scarce one. We're going to talk more about that one later today. We're going to talk about passive income and define exactly what that really means. What does passive mean? We're also going to talk about how to best increase your velocity of money. Is it by doing a 1031 tax deferred exchange or a cash out refinance with your income property? Let's go to the listener question about this. Hi, Keith. This is Jacob Ayers from Houston, Texas. First, I want to thank you for putting out such great content every week on the GRE podcast. I get a ton of value from the show. Keith, the question I have today is for those investors who are looking to expand their portfolio and comparing the options of a 1031 tax deferred exchange to a cash out refinance. Do you find one option to be better than the other? Thank you for that rather eloquently stated question there, Jacob. And it is a germane time to discuss this because there's a lot of equity out there that is ripe for harvest because most markets have appreciated for a good seven or eight years in a row here. Really, this is a question about moving equity to keep it working for you. What is the best vehicle for increasing your velocity of money? Since the return from property equity is always zero, ideally you want to take a big chunk of it and splinter it off into a bunch of little pieces and that way you can leverage more property. So let's back up first. There are actually three ways for you to move equity should you so choose if that's right for you. The first way is to sell your property outright. That way you get all of your equity out. Now, Jacob, you're a savvy investor, so that's why you probably didn't even bring that up as one of the ways that you can move equity because you probably wouldn't even consider it. Because, of course, the big problem with this is that when you sell an income property, you could sell your current equity heavy property and buy another. But the problem with selling is that you'd probably have to pay capital gains tax, which would reduce the equity that you would have available to reinvest. And you're also going to have to pay depreciation recapture. Yes, that is all of the depreciation that you wrote off against your taxes every year that you own the income property. That will be recaptured from that first income tax return that you file after the property sale. So you might have a nice gain, but the tax hit is harsh. That is, of course, unless you move your equity in the second of three ways and you perform a 1031 tax-deferred exchange. If you meet the rules of the 1031 exchange, you can avoid all of the nasty bite of the capital gains tax and all of the depreciation recapture. Yes, it can all be 100% avoided. In fact, the exchange is the best way to move your equity. If you follow the rules and do the exchange properly, you can move 100% of your net equity tax-free. 
Sometimes people point out that exchanging is really tax deferred and not tax free. But I mean, come on, the exchange itself, if it's done correctly, it is tax free because the capital gain is carried to the next property without being taxed. And therefore, in real estate, capital gains is a voluntary tax. What I mean by that is that the gain is not taxed unless you, the owner, volunteers by selling the property outright and not doing an exchange. Instead of selling, savvy investors, they just continue to exchange over and over and over again and keep rolling it over to more properties down the road until they die. And then your cumulative gains over your entire lifetime, they are forgiven completely upon your death. And that is because of the stepped up basis rules. Be sure to ask your good tax manager about the details of the stepped up basis rules. I'm not going to get into that here. But that's why exchanges are effectively tax free. But whether you call it tax deferred, which is technically what it's called, or tax free, exchanging is one of the most powerful things in the entire tax code, the whole 5,800 pages or whatever Tom Wheelwright says it is. But it's very much misunderstood by accountants and attorneys and real estate agents. And, you know, actually, during my first ever 1031 exchange, I soon learned that my income property agent had never gone through this before, even though we were working together to make it happen. Now, I devoted an entire episode to the 1031 exchange here for you a few months ago, so I'm not going to get into all the details and all the nuance of the rules again here on this episode. The most important thing I can tell you, though, is that to pull off a 1031 exchange is to enlist a 1031 exchange QI, the qualified intermediary. Get them involved early on. Get them involved before you even sell the property that you want to sell. From the time that you sell your equity-heavy property that you want to get rid of, you have 45 days to identify a qualified replacement property and 180 days to close on that identified replacement property. And there are all kinds of rules and limits around how to identify a property but it must be specific. You can't say that your replacement property is going to be a green duplex in Kansas City. You've got to give a specific legal address. And the episode that I completely devoted to the 1031 exchange topic a few months ago, where I discussed the rules and the critical mistakes to avoid and the deadlines and everything else for you, that is Get Rich Education Podcast, episode number 143. So the first way to access equity in a property is to sell it outright. The second way is through the exchange. And the third way, which you mentioned, Jacob, is with the cash out refinance, refinancing it and extracting cash out of it at the same time. The problem with the cash out refinance is that you typically cannot access all of the equity in a property because you are not selling it like you are with the other two methods. So if you've got 50% equity in a property that you want to get rid of, you can get all 50% out with the straight sale or with the exchange. But here with the cash out refinance, you might only be able to access 30% of the property value with the cash out refinance because you might only be able to get an 80% loan to value loan. A bank is going to make you keep 20% equity in there as your skin in the game or something like that. The advantage of the cash out refinance is that you shouldn't have to pay tax on the equity that you extract because the IRS classifies this as debt. There's no tax on debt that you've originated. One advantage of the cash out refi over the 1031 is that the cash out refi is typically going to go faster and it's just going to be less stressful. You can move at your own pace with the 1031 you're selling at least one property and you're buying at least one property. So now you have all these steps, inspection, appraisal, you're going to incur make ready expenses for your sales and you're often going to be paying an agent commission too. With a cash out refi, you typically just have an appraisal. There won't be any inspection, there won't be any make ready and there won't be any agent commission because nothing's being sold. But a 1031 is typically the best vehicle for moving equity from a strict dollars perspective. A 1031 is also a better move if you want to sell like some underperforming dog of a property. Maybe you can't seem to keep it rented to decent tenants or something, but yet you've built equity in the property. 
if you own a property that's been good to you, but it's become too equity heavy, you might be tempted to do a cash out refi instead of a 1031. But yet, if you can replace your nice cash flowing property with one that cash flows even better, then you need to consider the 1031. So when it comes to the cash out refi, if you think that's your better choice, remember, and this is especially true if you're looking to do a cash out refi of your own home, your primary residence, you can often take out a second mortgage and keep the first mortgage in place untouched. That might be a good option for you if you still like your first mortgage's low interest rate or if you like your first mortgage's advanced amortization schedule. A cash out refi, that doesn't mean that you have to restructure every part of the debt on one property. You can keep a first mortgage in place and see if you qualify for a second. And just a word of caution on the second mortgage cash out refi, if your second is a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, those HELOC interest rates are not fixed. They float in lockstep with the federal funds rate, which is expected to increase. So to be safe, you want the cash on cash return from your new purchase to equal or exceed that of the mortgage interest rate on the property that you just took cash out of. So Although I like the 1031 more than the cash out refi overall, I can think of a couple other disadvantages of the 1031. With the exchange, you may very well experience a degree of stress, much of it having to do with the timing of meeting those 45 and 180 day milestones that I mentioned earlier. You really don't want to be on a three week vacation to Peru and Ecuador during your big 1031. On the properties that you identified as replacements for moving your equity into tax-free, something might get slowed down in your ability to buy them that's out of your control. Or if you're looking to 1031 your equity into new construction property and the new construction is coming along too slowly, that can create some stress right there. With the cash out refi, you're on your own deadlines, not the 1031 deadlines that the IRS sets for you. You know, another thing, another small disadvantage with the 1031 exchange that people just never think about it. Everyone overlooks this. I didn't really see it coming until I had the ball rolling with my first ever 1031. It's that during that time, those three months or so after you've sold your relinquished property and before you've closed on your replacement property, you've lost cash flow because there's that gap there, that delayed exchange gap where you don't own some property at all for a period of a few months. I've done a 1031 with a substantial chunk of my portfolio, and I had about three months where a major piece of my cash flow was cut off until I closed on the replacement. So 1031s and cash out refis have definitely been good for me. I've certainly made some mistakes in real estate investing, but having an early awareness of the fact that dead equity is not serving me and then actually doing something about it, that really helped get me to where I am today. If you've got a lot of equity in a property or you've got a property paid off, you've got to realize that your money just got really lazy. Not only is it not working for you, you're paying the opportunity cost of not using it to also leverage other people's money to come back in and work for you. So don't let your money get lazy. When I've built up around 35% equity in an income property, that's what I'm looking forward to moving it. It's that 35% mark. With the primary residence, it would be less than 35% because I can usually pull out more. I can pull out equity up to a higher loan to value ratio. Just think about property that you have 50% equity in. Now your leverage ratio has been slashed down to two to one. If you reposition it with 20% down payments on multiple properties, now your leverage ratio is five to one. And that is just huge. And it's great as long as you've safeguarded controlling your cash flow. And we love cash flow. But what has created more wealth for real estate investors is really leveraged appreciation. So consider keeping your leverage ratio up there by maintaining small equity positions in a bunch of properties. And you know what else? The more that you learn about the economy, pulling dollars out of property and transferring it into another property, that actually expands credit. That very act expands the money supply and it stokes inflation. 
And as you know from listening to this show, inflation is actually our friend. So great question from Jacob asking about the pros and cons of a 1031 exchange versus a cash out refinance. By the way, that Jacob was Jacob Ayers. He is the host of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast. That's another show that you can listen to. You know what's funny? Some podcasters, they don't want to talk about other podcasts similar to theirs, or they're afraid that they're going to lose listeners to that other show that they talk about. Well, I just don't feel that way. And Well, maybe that's part of my abundance mentality. Of course, I value listeners and anyone wants more listeners, just like an artist would want more people to see what they've been spending weeks painting on on the canvas. You can check out the Real Estate Guys radio show with Robert Helms and Russell Gray. That's a really good one. Sheesh, I've even got a commercial on my show that tells you about someone else's podcast, The Cash Flow Ninja, hosted by my friend, MC Laubscher. That's another good show that you can check out. He's had some great guests on his show like Ron Paul, Robert Kiyosaki, and Jim Rogers. Once again, Jacob Ayers' show is called The Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom. Uber and autonomous cars are killing the parking lot, and that is going to change real estate. I'm going to discuss that with you in a bit. I've also got some Dave Ramsey fallout from our episode two weeks ago. You know, if you want to learn more about the misconceptions around debt and equity, which is really what we've been talking about in this discussion so far, and how to use debt and equity to your advantage and use them in the way that affluent people use them, and why getting your money to work for you will not create wealth, and how to get other people's money ethically working for you to create wealth and a lot more, Well, on all those topics, I wrote a book less than nine months ago about how you can do that. You can get the e-version of the book completely free, not just a free chapter or something like that, but the complete e-book free. Robert Sislow is going to tell you how easy it is to do that now. Go. 71% of Americans aren't saving enough for retirement. It's going to get worse as people live longer, and you need to start thinking differently. But you can't lose your time. Real estate is the investment vehicle that's made more ordinary people wealthy than anything else. Keith Weinhold of Get Rich Education is hosts of one of America's top investing shows, Disrupting Wall Street. He's an international best-selling author, a writer for Rich Dad Advisors, and has been an active income property investor since 2002. He has created thousands in passive monthly income for countless followers. And now he has a free book, The Seven Principles for Creating Wealth in Your Life. Get your copy now at GetRichEducation.com forward slash book. That's GetRichEducation.com forward slash book. Because invest in what produces income for you now and later. Keith Weinhold is your guy. Sign up now at GetRichEducation.com forward slash book. MC Laubscher is the host of the top-rated business and investing podcast, Cash Flow Ninja, and also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth. They help busy people build wealth outside of Wall Street by strategically combining their clients' cash flow statements with the financial vehicle of the wealthy, according to the infinite banking concept. If you are interested to learn how to perpetually multiply your wealth, you can access an exclusive webinar at your own banking system. Cashflow real estate investors, if you're looking for a mortgage loan with a company that specializes in investment property loans, it's Ridge Lending Group. They provide income property loans in almost every U.S. state. Ridge has worked with tens of thousands of investors and homeowners all over the country. In fact, with ethics and transparency, they've helped more people realize their dreams through real estate investing than any other mortgage lender in the country. Get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is Rich Dad Advisor, Garrett Sutton. To grow your wealth, listen to the always valuable Get Rich Education. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. We got more great feedback on our episode from two weeks ago when we were talking about the largely really antiquated Dave Ramsey debt-free school of thought. We're talking about a school of thought that has in the past suggested that people eat things like cheap processed ramen noodles and beans and rice so that they'll have more money in their pocket so that they can pay off a car loan or a mortgage loan. When you pay down debt that's lower than the rate of inflation, now you've actually diminished your prosperity. So now you've diminished your prosperity and you've eaten 
granola bars and cup of noodles or whatever. So now you've sacrificed your health just to diminish your prosperity. Plus, you took time to learn about how to live like that. That is just so absurd and scarcity minded. And that is not serving people. Oh, I am not going to go on. I don't want to dip into hyperbole, but hearing about that stuff is just really dispiriting. You have got to laugh to keep from crying. If I'm going to use my time to learn about something, I want to learn how to produce, not reduce. I think part of them is realizing that actually money is an abundant resource. Yes, money is an abundant resource. How much currency does the Treasury Department print every day? During fiscal year 2014, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing delivered approximately 6.6 billion notes to the Federal Reserve. They produced approximately 24.8 million notes every day with a face value of approximately 560 million. Those numbers are so large that some people cannot even fathom it. Those stats right there, actually those stats can be picked apart all day, okay? Most dollars aren't even printed, of course. They're digital and they're created out of thin air when dollars are borrowed into creation, but it just gives you some idea of how abundant money is. Look, my personal monthly internet bill is $145. And my cable TV bill is $126. Yes, I have cable because it's just a nice option and money is an abundant resource. I just learned how much these bills were because I just saw the bills come in. You know, I'm just really barely aware of my consumer bills. I'm into expanding my upside instead. I don't even know how much my monthly phone bill is. Maybe $100. Okay, so for internet, cable, and phone combined, that's what, $370 some dollars a month? Is that a lot? I don't know. It just doesn't matter that much. I'm focused on what matters. Expanding the upside. Money is an abundant resource. How much do you like to spend on a hotel? Okay, to me, it seems like $300 a night. That's a pretty common number to spend at a decent hotel. All right, then to me, what about a $79 hotel? Well, you know what? I wouldn't even want to stay there. I might not even want to stay there for free. But you know what? Everyone has learned how to tap into abundance at a different level. Everyone's got their price, okay? What about a $2,500 a night hotel? What if I were staying there? I might think that price is pretty steep. I've got to admit, I would be asking myself a question like, now, why am I staying at a $2,500 hotel? Is this my honeymoon or something? I mean, maybe I would go move to a different hotel. Well, didn't I just say that money was an abundant resource then? So what's my problem? Maybe things don't add up here. Maybe the Amazon founder, Jeff Bezos, he wouldn't want to stay in a $300 hotel like me that I'm more used to and just think of as a standard. He might live in the $2,500 hotel year round if he had to because it just doesn't matter to him. See, Jeff Bezos and Amazon.com, they have figured out how to provide more value to more people than you have and than I have. Money is an abundant resource, but just because something is abundant, it doesn't mean that it has no value. Look, the air that you breathe all around you is pretty abundant, but it's still really valuable. We would die without air, just like we would financially die without money, but yet they're both abundant. Right now, I am not too far away from, and maybe you're not too far away from a parking lot with hundreds of cars in it. So cars look pretty abundant, but each one still has value and utility, just like dollars. So the point is that a scarcity mindset and an abundant mindset are relative in a sense. But really, if you're looking to produce before you reduce, that is an abundant mind. So money is an abundant resource. And the amount of the world's abundant supply of money that will be allocated to you on this earth is directly proportional to how much value you create for others. How much sound housing can you create for others? Money is an abundant resource. Well, way back in episode 13 of Get Rich Education, yes, more than three years ago, I did an episode called Autonomous Cars Will Soon Disrupt Your Life 
and investments. And I talked about how this will have implications for real estate investing. Well, you know what? We're already seeing the world go in that direction. In fact, ride-sharing services are accelerating this effect already. Fortune Magazine just reported this in the last couple weeks here in an article called Uber Really Is Killing the Parking Business. In the article, it outlined how ride-hailing services like Uber and Lyft are having a negative impact on the demand for parking. The picture, at least for those trying to rent you a parking space, is bleak. So here the article reported, they said that in the email unearthed from a company report by the San Diego Union Tribune, Ace Parking CEO John Baumgartner says that demand for parking at hotels in San Diego has dropped by 5 to 10 percent, while restaurant valet demand is down 25 percent. The biggest drop, unsurprisingly, has been at nightclubs where demand for valet parking has dropped a whopping 50%. The numbers appear to be estimates, and Baumgartner doesn't describe a time frame for the deadlines. And the assessment, which was written last September, which is six months ago, that's also limited to San Diego, though an ACE parking executive told the Union Tribune that it has seen similar declines at 750 parking operations around the United States. So this company, ACE Parking, They're focused on using technology, including better parking, scheduling, and booking options just to try to remain healthy. But much more is at stake than the revenues of the parking business. Cities stand to benefit immensely as demand for parking drops because parking spaces and lots, they generate relatively little tax revenue or economic activity relative to commercial operations. An increasing sprawl may actually harm the economy of cities like Los Angeles. Even back in 2015, cities were already relaxing zoning requirements that set minimum parking allotments, and there are now even more signs that city planners are thinking differently about parking. Now, get this right here, okay? Back into the article here. Perhaps most dramatically, a new Major League Soccer stadium being planned for David Beckham's Miami expansion team may include no new parking at all, but it will have designated pickup zones for Uber and Lyft. The decline of parking will only be accelerated if and when autonomous vehicles become widespread. That sea change, which will make it easier to locate parking at a distance from urban destinations, could further reduce car ownership. That will be bad news for the ace parkings of the world, but everyone else should welcome the decline of the urban parking lot. And that's it for the article right there. So I told you back in episode 13 that this will spell a dramatic shift in the character and makeup of inner cities and suburbs alike. Right now, a lot of U.S. cities have central agglomerations where the surface area is 40 to as much as 60% parking space. And when you hire a rideshare car, You didn't need to drive your own car to work, and you didn't have to park your car. They're just going to pick you up. Soon, autonomous cars are expected to be all over the road, and they'll just always stay in motion. And you know what else this means for homes that are out in the suburbs? Homes with garages could become less desirable over time. Now, they'll probably just repurpose the garages, but in any case, so many trends are changing the way that humans interact with real estate, and the economy. The internet diminished the need for office space as that almost completely wiped out the need for things like travel agencies. The internet reduced the number of all kinds of other businesses like the number of branch banks that you have. Of course, Amazon just continues to keep killing the traditional retail consumer good purchases. Rideshare services and autonomous cars are now diminishing the parking business This one is happening right in front of our eyes. It is happening now. There's no more someday on that one. It's already begun. And despite all these trends out there, you know what? The residential real estate space is the one that's not impacted nearly as much. That's why we focus on the residential space here. Not only is it easier for people to understand because you interact with residential space every day of your life, but residential is here to stay. Well, because we're around residential real estate every day, it's kind of paradoxical that it is misunderstood 
by so many people. When you tell a lot of people out there that you're a real estate investor, oftentimes they think that you're a house flipper. But then if they hear that you've got rental property, then the next thing that they think is that you must be a landlord. Well, if you're either of those things, especially the landlord, you're not getting a very good ROL, return on life. So let's talk about passivity. You have the ability to make real estate investing passive. And at the beginning of this show, it says that you've created more passive income from this show than nearly any other show in the world. Well, even if you're hands off and you're not the landlord, it still doesn't feel so passive if you've got a week where your rental property's roof blew off and you're looking at contractor quotes that your managers pulled together for you and you're kind of managing this insurance claim that you had to put in. Well, aren't you working for your passive income a little bit then? And I would say that, yes, you are at that time. Your property might operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week for many weeks in a row or even months in a row without your involvement at all. It probably operates for you passively 98 or 99% of the time or more passively. That's why it's called passive income. For you, it's hands off. You're not fixing leaky faucets and you're not collecting rent checks. The tenant might not even know who you are. When the problem that you have 1% of the time blows over, well, you're just right back to passive income again. Okay, well, compare that to your work at a job. What happens when you have a problem at work? You have to deal with it, you handle it, and then what happens when that problem is handled and goes away? You go right back to having to go to active income again. It doesn't go back to passive. At work, whether you have a problem or whether things are going fine, it takes your involvement either way. And that's really my point here for you. It is never passive unless maybe you've got some vacation time. Then maybe you can say your active job is just 5 or 10% passive. In real estate investing, with the way we do it, passivity is the norm, not the exception. That's why it's passive income. So just keep in mind that if, and really not if, but when you have to be resilient during some bumps in your almost always passive real estate investment portfolio. And, you know, there is so much I want to talk to you about every week that I just can barely fit it all in. That's why I do these monologue shows with no guest once in a while. I haven't even told you about my recent real estate field trip to Florida and then the other one that I took to Belize yet, although I'm really looking forward to telling you more about those here. You are really out there taking action. So before you go, let me just help you with one other thing while you're out there looking at properties. Don't underestimate the expenses that you project that your property is going to have. Okay, of course, your mortgage and all of your other expenses are completely 100% outsourced to your tenant in a cash flowing property. It's easy for you to remember that you have a mortgage payment, principal plus interest, because that's your largest expense. You know that I've mentioned that an easy way to remember your other recurring expenses, which really are all of the operating expenses, because principal and interest are not operating expenses is with that acronym VIMTUM, V-I-M-T-U-M. And I think I mentioned that again last week when Clayton Morris interviewed me. But let's hit each one of these. In VIMTUM, V-I-M-T-U-M, the first V, vacancy, that depends on your property type and that depends on the local job market and your vacancy rate depends on other factors. 8% of the gross rent amount, that's often a good number for vacancy because that equates to about one month per year of vacancy. But if you're in a strong job market, which is, I hope, where you're investing, 4 or 5%, that might work. You're kind of guessing there. Insurance, which is the I in VIMTUM, your lien holder requires you to have property insurance. Having a policy reduces your risk too. You can get quoted an exact number there. The M, maintenance. Now, here is where a lot of people underestimate this number for maintenance. It can be 3% to 15% or even more of the gross rent amount. And this is where you must make your best guess based on the property age, history, and other factors. T is for taxes. You have a property tax obligation Often it's 1% to 3% of the property value annually, depending on the area. 
And this is an exact number that's easy to find in county or municipal records. The U in VIMTUM is for utilities. Now, in a single family income property, your tenant typically pays the utilities. The more units that are in a property, the more likely you're going to be the one paying the heat, the electric, the refuse, the water, and so on. Utility companies have historical records, so you can make a pretty close expense determination there. And then finally, the last letter in the acronym VIMTUM is the second M, management. If you don't have a property manager, then your income is not passive. If you self-manage, then you must factor in your time expense. Management fees are typically 3% to 10% of the gross monthly rent amount. The more units in a building, the lower the management expense. People like easy ways to remember things. That's why I like VimTum. And I also made a video for you about these income property operating expenses where I'm talking directly to you. I'll put that video link in the show notes for you. So when you connect with an income property provider at greturnkey.com, if they haven't, then run your numbers on an income property using that VimTum acronym along with your mortgage. Those providers at greturnkey.com, what you can do there is download a market report, get their contact information, and see what they have for inventory. And yes, inventory sure is thin in most markets these days. I appreciate the time that you spent with me today, but you weren't here for me. You were here for you. Until next week, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. Ranked by Forbes as one of the fastest growing cities, Orlando, Florida has a big and diverse economy, yet still features affordable rental properties that cash flow. Our Boots on the Ground turnkey provider, Greg Bond, wrote a special report to help you discover the amazing market of Orlando. Request your free copy today. Visit GetRichEducation.com forward slash Orlando. That's GetRichEducation.com forward slash Orlando. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.